Hier ist Florian und ich bin hier heute mit Michael, Michael von Röde. Hi, ich bin Michael. Oh, Michael, okay. Well, we speak English, right? Let's do English, uh, Michael. So, um, the interesting thing is about Michael, like he, he knows both worlds. He knows the big corporate world and also the small startup world. So tell us something, uh, how, how it's different out of your perspective. Well, it's very different and I always say uh, both sides have good and bad things. So it's not like the corporate world is old and crappy and nobody should work there or startup world is too dangerous and too small. Uh, there's pros and cons on both sides and what I try to do all the time is I've seen both uh, sides as you said. I try to, you know, see the good things and bring those together. Um, so apart from size, obviously that's different. Um, the way of working is still different, although I see that corporates try to adopt some of the, say, uh, ways of working from, from smaller companies, especially startups. Uh, simply because I feel that uh, you know the younger generation um, they, they don't accept that they have to work from nine to five to take a simple example uh, so uh, uh, to generalize it in the corporate world working in general is more structured uh, so there are more rules um, there are more boundaries um, simply because uh, you know to organize a bigger team you need some more structure Yeah, and the, the other way around, you see in the startup world, I'm often being asked also by, by investors that I can help uh, when a startup is, say, north of a certain size. And my experience is there's several levels where you get different problems. So the first one is you found a startup, you let's say three founders, and then you have, I don't know, two interns. Everybody works at the kitchen table, super cool. There's no overhead to, to align things, so that's the first. And then you grow north of 10 people, then you know not, you can't talk to everybody every day, and you need to also split your work a bit. And then the next step is probably, I don't know, depends a bit, 30 to 50 people. Then you need to start having some, let's say, well, let's call it departments, uh, who have certain responsibilities. And then the next step is, I think, 150. Why? Because then you have to start to have potentially hierarchies. Um, so this is how, how, how things evolve. Um, although I have to say there's new concepts which we're also trying to follow uh, in, in, in my company, in Sensorberg. Uh, if you read a book like uh, The Exponential Organization, I find that very interesting, which is more about self-organizing. Um, and I think this will um, come first in startups because they, they, it's easier to experiment there. Yeah? In, in, a, in, a, in a corporate, uh, Well, you have, as I said, more regulations. Uh, you can't take that much risk because if you do something wrong, you destroy more. It's as simple as that, right? Um, yeah, I think that, that's, that's first of all the, the, the main high-level differences. And then there's lots of uh, detail. Um, for example, a, a corporate is always more visible. So if Mercedes uh, does something, doesn't fully follow all the rules, and we talk about it now, we're in Germany, so we talk about things like you know, Gewerbeaufsichtsamt, I don't know what that is in English, uh, let's find out via Google. Uh, so there's a regulation in Germany, for example, how many square meters each employee has to have. And let's, let's face it, that we probably both know many startups where that rule either is unknown or even if it's known, it's not entirely followed. Yeah. You can't do this in a corporate, yeah. right? Uh, not only because there is a works council, a Betriebsrat, but also because they're under higher like observation by the authorities. So they have to follow these things. Um, also, often they're uh, more international, so there's more coordination needed for that. Um, so uh, I don't think that corporates, you know, decided at some point in history that they have to be complicated. It just comes with the with the size. And and if you look at at big startups or ex startups, take Google or Facebook, but I think Google is a good example. They think a lot about how to prevent this. And if you read. What they publish, they're pretty open about that, which I love because uh, everybody can learn from that. I mean, there's this great Google HR website, which I use a lot. Uh, they really have to work hard against that because if you don't do anything, you become more complicated. Um, and in a startup, you're obviously naturally more nimble. Um, but uh, uh, let's, take, let's take a disadvantage of that. Um, onboarding experience, I think, is a good example. So if, if a corporate onboards new employees, They come in the first day, they have a nice desk, they have a computer, they have their company uh, badge, they have, I don't know, some branded uh, marketing material, and they have someone they can talk to, some call it buddy or mentor, who helps them guiding through the organization, 
uh, and the PC is set up and they have an account and this and that and then they get also um, uh, you know a tour in a startup that might happen in a good one and I hope it happens in mine but in a, you know I know many startups where you have the first day and then you walk in nobody takes notice say hi hey, I'm such and such and then after an hour somebody might come along saying hey okay you're new here perhaps I can help you but it's more naturally organized it's not formally organized um, and uh, some people feel lost in that, especially if they come from a corporate. So if you switch, and that's how it was for me, you know there was no formal experience what to do the first few days. You find out yourself. Um, training is another example. In a corporate, you usually either have, a, they have their own training unit and they offer lots of trainings and you have a nice training catalog in the intranet, or some, sometimes even still on paper. Uh, but there is something. In a startup, nobody thinks about training. And uh, some smart employees, they ask about it. And then, uh, you know, I have that in my company. So they say, yeah, I, I, you know, we talk about personal development. And then I say, yeah, look for something. I don't know. What do you want to do? So you have to be much more proactive and a self-starter to, to, to get this in a startup. Whereas in a corporate, that, you know, you can just go with the flow if you want. Um, so these are d tangible examples where uh, th 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 I think it's a big difference. And if you see it from an uh, employee perspective, uh, you know, what to work. Um, when you start, uh, you come from university and start in a corporate, you know, you're like a small little piece of a big machine. And it's hard to get uh, lots of responsibility. And in a startup, it depends, but I think you get responsibility much faster with all the pros and cons, because that can also be a burden. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's a bit of a personal choice what you like better. I believe seeing both is always good, not only to learn from both ways of working, but it's also good for your own career, because I can tell you I still have advantages when I talk even to customers now, and they see I've been working in Accenture for six years or in Vodafone for seven years. They somehow automatically assume that I'm more, I don't know, nah, reliable is perhaps the wrong word, but more, you know, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. Uh, but I'm still the same person, right? So that's uh, interesting for me. Mm. So it helps also when you start your career to see both sides. And then if, especially if you work in a startup, which is enterprise B2B, that helps me a lot in my sales process. I know how the other side is buying. And the buying is very complex. I, I, I do a bit of mentoring as well, and I mentor in enterprise B2B sales. You know, understanding a buying center, that there's not one guy deciding what to buy, but there's plenty of people, and there's internal fights, and there's interests, and which is normal when more than 10 people work together. You know, that's what happens between humans. Uh, to understand that and deal with that, uh, it's helpful to know both sides. Awesome, awesome. So, um, how many how many employees you have right now in your in your startup? Uh, twenty eight. Twenty eight. Yeah. So it's still fairly small, um, which I enjoy on one hand. On the other hand, you know, my skill uh, is obviously to run uh, bigger entities, but that's now as I'm the CEO, it's in my hands to grow the company, and then we will be probably not five hundred soon, but you know, more than now. Um, but I already see these things that I just mentioned, you know. Um, what I try to do in Sensorberg, I, I lead the team. So we have departments, so we have a sales department, we have a delivery department, a tech department and so on. Um, but I try to leave uh, everybody in my company, but also the, you know, my managers or my, 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 yeah, my direct reports, lots of freedom how they run their team. And also the people, I always say, in this company, thinking is not forbidden. So if someone from development uh, teams up with a designer and a sales guy, uh, and we just recently had that to relaunch the website, but nobody told them, that's what I love. I mean, when there, there's informal groups across departments just coming out and doing stuff. Um, challenge with that is, especially for the, their managers, that because they have to manage the capacity. So what do, how do we deal with that? We try to set very clear goals to everybody. But if people feel they want to do more or they find the time or they think this is very important, they, they are allowed to do it. And, um, you know, they don't need to ask anybody. I think that's important, um, both for our company, but also as a, you know, for the people because they, they're motivated and they can do stuff outside of their immediate area of responsibility. And with that, you immediately connect different departments. Yeah, I find it important that my development guys can talk to the salespeople and vice versa, for example. 
Uh, also, I try to give a lot of context. So every week um, I, we have an all hands where I share the latest sales figures, but also a bit about the product roadmap to everybody. Uh, or the salespeople tell what kind of customers they're uh, looking into and the developers say what they're working on. Because I believe uh, for everyone in a company to take good decisions, they need to have a bit of context. We have barely any private channels on Slack. I know companies who have lots of private channels. I don't believe in that. We have only those channels private which are required by law. So for example, HR, when we talk about salaries, we're not allowed. Uh, and I don't think that would be appropriate that everybody knows everybody's salary uh, and in Germany it's illegal. So those are private. But um, And then there's a channel for, for the management team if we talk about people. That's also not appropriate. But everything else are public channels and everybody can join any channel. And uh, there's no, you know, the people don't ask stupid questions. So like why is now the developer in the sales channel or the sales guy in the developer's channel? If they're interested, why not? So that's how we try to overcome the necessary split into teams because you have to have teams. Uh, I had a boss a long time ago who said, you know, whatever you do in organizational design, you have to slice the cake in some way. You can do it this way or this way, mm -hmm. but you can't, not everybody can have just a single boss. Mm -hmm. Also because people deserve to have someone and I don't see it so much as a boss, more as a coach and mentor and someone who helps you doing your work. But if that's more than 10 people, my experience is you're not good at it. Yeah. So if you give a heads up to all your employees, like weekly or monthly, like you bring them all together in one room for one hour or how you handle that communication wise? Well, we're bringing all together in this room yeah. uh, for half an hour. Uh, uh, we have to think about what we do if we're more than, I mean, this room can fit perhaps, I don't know, 20 people. Yeah. Not everybody's there all the time. Okay. Right. So that's why we still can do it. Uh, I think I would do it as a hangout probably. So okay. uh, be, I also believe in home office. Um, and you know flexible working so you know you can't guarantee that everybody is just in the office so I would do a hangout and then yes but it's everybody um, I think this is possible up to I'm sure a hundred people okay. the challenge starts and I have been running teams across three continents at Vodafone so you know there were people that say or projects there were people in the US and in Europe and in, in Asia you have a time zone problem that's the main problem right yeah, yeah because well for the European it's okay because they're in the middle Yeah. So for us, it's nicely at lunchtime, but then the Asians, they, they have to stay out, up long and the, yeah. the Americans have to get up early. So that's where the problems, uh, well, problems, the challenges start and then we have to think about it. But, you know, we will figure that out when we're there. How, how did you solve it in, uh, in, Vodo, in your Vodafone? Vodo um, a, we, had, uh, we introduced, and that's uh, quite a long time ago, that was like in the mid-2000s, um, we felt that the teams are a bit disconnected, so I introduced a big screen in uh, all the, this was open office, so we had an open office in Tokyo, we, and back then we worked with Motorola, there was an open office and in London as well, and then we had one in Düsseldorf. And we had big screens in each of the offices and there was a constant video connection. So why? Because I wanted to reduce the hurdle to talk to people. How do you do this? You don't want to make a call. That's also a hurdle. Do I call the guy or not? Yeah. So if you have a constant video running, you just stand in front of the screen, you shout in the room, just like uh, you would do it in, in a physical room. Yeah. Um, and that helped. I think nowadays there are also uh, things like, you know, uh, I would love to order one of those nice little robots which have an iPad on top and run around, no, roll around to be precise, they're a bit expensive, but I think those concepts will help. Um, and the other concept I think will help is, uh, and I mentioned that before, a constant communication and transparency uh, to give that context because that makes it just easier to, to you know, work between teams because they have the same base of knowledge what's going on overall. And the next question I have is like, how do you motivate or encourage your team to talk to each other? Like, it's not natural for a salesperson to talk to developers or vice mm -hmm. versa. So how do you motivate them to do that? Mm -hmm. um, I think one, it's a cultural question. So uh, uh, how do, what's, what's the company culture? And I know this is a big word. Uh, and I don't believe in HR team writing down a culture or the CEO and that's the culture then. That's not going to work. The culture has to evolve and people have to live it. Um, actually, I, to, I would love to, if I could say, I motivate them in a great way, but honestly, I, I don't do much about it. I mean, I obviously talk a lot to people and um, perhaps I'm lucky that I have people in my team who just do that. Um, 
What helps is uh, that they work together on certain, let's say, more informal projects, like internal things. So they, they, you know, they get used to work in a work group, and I don't choose the work groups, and not, not with the managers. They do that themselves. So somebody says on Slack, okay, you, we need, as I mentioned, that is, I think, a good example. Uh, we need to do something about our website. I don't like it. Somebody starts with it. And then uh, somebody says, like, who can chip in? And then the designer comes, yeah, I can help with the design. And then the one developer says, hey, you know what? I have some spare time. Uh, or they say, I need some back-end help because this only works when we change the back-end. And then they I just walk to them or ask them or he says uh, or she, hey, I can help you. And once that happened and you have, you know, it's not awkward because you have a joint yeah, project in the end, a joint goal, then it's natural to talk to each other because you have to, because you solve a problem together. So it's not about cramming everybody in one room and say, hey guys, mingle and talk. That never works. That's what usually the, you have those games, mingling games, but I think it's much more efficient and natural if you do this on a tangible problem you have work-wise in the company anyway. And that's what we do. How you how you motivate people to to look for problems and then communicate them out there? Like It's also really interesting mm -hmm. because it's something more entrepreneurial, more more startup thing like to see, oh, that's a problem here, let's post it out and let's see what we can do about it. Yeah. I wondered about that too, how I did motivate them. I probably have to ask them because honestly, I, I, I don't know, they do it and I'm very, very happy. And so when I saw it the first time, I do encourage people doing that and said, look, this is exactly what I want. And uh, uh, obviously that encouraged them to do more of the same, but I didn't start it. I mean, I was positively surprised when I saw that the first time in this company happening. Um, and I guess it's an indirect motivation because we have an open atmosphere and have to give people this leeway uh, and don't, you know, I don't go to people and ask them why they are like now working on X, Y, Z when they should do sales or vice versa. You know, I just don't do that. And I don't think my managers do it. Um, and, and I think that helps already to give the chance and the freedom that they're not worried that am I allowed to do it? Just giving you know implicit permission, so to speak, helps already. Um, and other than that, what also helps, I think, is that I share my problems with the whole team. I say, look, our issue right now is getting the new financing round, or the issue is we need more sales, or I'm I'm worried about the, our product quality, or. Mm, I'm not so sure if we do enough on our product security or whatever it is. So I share my agenda um, and I also share um, where I want to go with the company. Um, and that gives them an idea where uh, we believe, uh, where I believe the problems are, um, which by the way, something is what, what Google does with OKR. That's nothing yeah. else is to make that transparent and give the people the chance yeah. to figure out, okay, the overall company wants to fly to the moon. Yeah. I'm here, what can I do? And I want to actually, I'm also interested in doing something else, but I need someone else and then they just go around. So, yes. However, I just this morning I had uh, feedback, uh, the uh, talk with uh, my head of delivery and he told me, and that's, I think it's also part of it. So I'd love to take feedback and I encourage my guys to give me feedback because nobody's perfect. And I know I ask a lot. Um, so he said, look, uh, don't give people even more context and don't stretch it too far. So I s recently shared in an all hands, you know, we just introduced this interactive building thing and now we changed the website. I didn't say we should, but they said, hey, you talk about this so much and on the website it says something else, so we need to change it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's say that was, I don't know, let's say three months ago. So two weeks ago, I introduced um, a, a new concept which I had in my head, which is about what I call the caring building. So the next step from the response of our interactive building is the caring building. It cares for its people in the building, okay? And that took it a step too far. So I need to learn if you do it too much, you have to be careful that people follow you and have a chance to digest what you're saying and what you're expecting. And that was interesting feedback. I give another example. I had a startup before where I shared our finance situation with everybody. Most CEOs don't do that because they think it's a secret. I don't think it's a secret uh, because it is what it is and it's a startup. And there I had someone coming to me after the meeting saying, hey, Michael, I appreciate really that you do this, but perhaps you shouldn't do it. I'm like, okay, interesting. Why? Well, it makes me worried and, you know, we trust you and it's your job to get this solved and we don't want to know that we might be bust in three months from now. Then I get worried that I lose my job, etc. I'm like, okay. So, there's a balance between sharing everything which I have on, in my head uh, and, and giving transparency and making people worried because they rightly so, I think, because that's what I'm paid for and what's my job is to, uh, you know, 
make them feel, so to speak, every bump on the road. Yeah. Yeah, more they say more feel give them more feel of the direction. Yeah. But when it's bumpy, yeah, fine, but fix it. Yeah. Don't talk about it. And that yeah. I find it very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's also really interesting. So really like let's go back to, to your example with the caring building. Because like right now the the building interacts with the user. Mm -hmm. That's like actual act, your actual user story. So it makes absolutely sense for me that a CEO gives the vision that the next step is the carrying building. Mm -hmm. Do you have an idea why it was too much on this point or like why some people think it was too much? Yeah, I, well, I, I had an idea and, and the guy who had a feedback talk with uh, gave me also an idea. So he said, um, you expect too much context. You need to give people time to digest things. Okay. Yeah? Uh, and it's true. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm fast. I'm very fast with my thoughts, I guess, and uh, uh, I, I skip some intermediate steps. Mm -hmm. So if I, you know, it's half hour meeting. So you shoot this out and say, yeah, we're gonna, you know, I think we should do a caring building, and this is how I think it should work. No, no, no. And they're like, wow, Jesus, just three months ago we we wanted to do a responsive building. Yes, I understand it builds on top of that, but we're even not there completely. And it's yeah. true, you know, we're still in product development, we're a startup. Yes, we do great access control, we start with sensors, but let's be honest, I mean, the perfect responsive building is not there yet. Yeah. And it will take another one to two years until we are there product-wise and, and, and uh, you know, also the building owners have to accept it and learn and the users and so on and so forth. So they're more like, gee, We're not even finished with that one. He comes around. There he comes around with the next idea. So I think it's more like that. It's uh, yeah. So how you would uh, approach it now? Because you could say on the one side, okay, I don't say it because I understood it could be too difficult to digest. I would spontaneously say I would still say it because people which develop it right now they understand more where the end point is. So their development right now can be more in the right direction if this is our end goal from 10 years now yeah so what what is more important for you and I would still say it because yeah. I agree with you I think it's important you know you lay out a map and you say okay you know in three years I want to be back there um, let's discuss how we get there and what are the intermediate steps uh, I think what I would do differently is give it more time have a separate don't throw it into an all hands within 15 minutes but prepare it properly do a nice presentation perhaps bring it more to life and take an hour with the team to yeah. discuss it. So I think uh, that's one. And the second one is probably prepare uh, the more senior people before uh, so they can spread the word. Yeah. So that's what I think those were the two mistakes I made, I guess. Yeah. Interesting. So um, if you compare your, like, your corporate life to your startup life, so how does the daily, normal day difference from both worlds? Yeah, so in a corporate life, uh, you're, um, um, how do you say it in English, you're controlled by others. Yeah. Um, so the, when you're an executive in a corporate, uh, your day starts, say, usually at eight, and it runs until at least 10 in the evening, and it's fully booked with meetings. You have yeah. rarely time to think. Unless you sit in a boring steering committee, then you can think. I hope no one from corporate, my ex-corporate companies, hears that. Anyway, so uh, it's, it's controlled by events which are generated outside of your immediate area of, of, of responsibility. The other thing is you sit a lot in meetings. And I talk about executive life, like manager's life, right? Uh, you sit, I mean, most of your day consists of meetings. Yeah. Um, what is also different is uh, it's much more politics. Yeah. And politics, you know, politics is not nothing negative as such. It's just a need when you work in a, in a, in a bigger group. Uh, but it's also, you know, many people together still have uh, uh, different agendas. So you have to f either find compromises or it's an, uh, I mean, if you look at Apple, Steve Jobs said what to do and then it was done. Yeah. And very strict. Uh, but in most corporates, this is not how it is. Yeah. In most corporates, you, you, you balance interest and, and there's different opinion, which is fine. Uh, but it takes just longer to, to um, align on them. So you spend a lot of time uh, on this. And I have to say, I worked mostly in, well, I never worked in a German corporate, so I don't know how it is in Germany. I can tell you in the Anglo-Saxon area, Accenture is American, Vodafone is British, uh, especially in Great Britain. So there's also lots of cultural differences between, uh, between different cultures. Um, usually you pre-discuss things before the meeting. Mm -hmm. 
So actually, the actual decision is not taken in the meeting, it's just formalized in the meeting. Mm -hmm. So you spend a lot of time in talking to colleagues over coffee. That's why mm -hmm. you drink a lot of coffee there. <laughs> okay. um, so, uh, you know, I had my colleague was running a Vodafone brand, so uh, and I was also do, was doing UX, and that has an overlap. So in the beginning, and I had a coach after a while. That's also something you get in the corporate more easily because the company pays you for a coach, and it's very good coaches, so she helped me a lot. And what I did wrong in the beginning, I just said, okay, it's very clear, we have to do it like this. Yeah. And I said it in the meeting where then the chief marketing officer was in and uh, the CEO of Vodafone Germany or whatever, so like high-ranking people, and that created too much of a friction. Yeah. And we had a debate in the meeting. Yeah. And in the English culture, you rather have the debate outside of the meeting, and in the meeting you just check up, everybody agrees, and that's it. Now, in, in, a, in a startup, you can have the debate in the meeting. Yeah. yeah, it's a working meeting, more yeah. like an uh, alignment meeting. I think that is a big difference. In, in, in corporate world, many meetings are on that level, are alignment meetings, whereas in the, in the startup world, most meetings are working meetings because there is not so much alignment needed, A, and B, you can't afford it. And C, uh, uh, if you run it like I try to run my company, the alignment happens implicitly because yeah. you give the big picture and everybody runs towards the same yeah. goal. And I make you a tangible example. Um, at uh, Vodafone, we had a service which was similar, let's say, to what we have today as WhatsApp, very yeah. early, way before WhatsApp was founded. Yeah. So we created that service. Um, the missing alignment was that the guy who was sitting on the SMS revenue stream was strongly against it, which I can understand personally, makes total sense. But obviously for the overall company, I yeah. thought it was totally wrong. Yeah. Now, that's why I always talk about uh, when you have to challenge the, the, and that's clearly the innovator's dilemma. Everybody knows that book. I still have, I think, 10 pieces in my cupboard to give it to corporates because that's what I have to read. What you have to change in a corporate is not, I mean, that's not people who are against innovation, but it's people who might lose something personally based on innovation because their bonus sits on something else. So what you have to do is you have to change the incentive scheme, yeah. schema. Yeah. Otherwise, you will not break this barrier. So these are things you have to keep in mind in a corporate, that uh, there's legacy, there's old revenue streams. In a startup, you don't have old revenue streams. You only have new revenue streams. Yeah. So it's much easier, which makes the alignment easier. But your question was, how is the daily work? So that is something. Then the other thing, which is very different, uh, as an executive from Vodafone, everybody wants something from you. You have a yeah. budget, all the agencies come, yeah. they invite you, the suppliers come. I can get any meeting I want. In a startup, usually you want something and yeah. nobody knows your company and it's yeah. very different. And I'm the same person. So for someone who changes from a fairly high-ranking position in a corporate, in a startup, that is a tough personal challenge because suddenly I always say, you know who your real friends are? Yeah. Business friends. Yeah? Yeah. I'm not talking about personal friends. Yeah, yeah. Because some they don't talk to, they don't pick up the phone anymore because you're not like the head of this and that in, yeah. in, in Vodafone, but you're just like the CEO of Sensorberg and who's the Sensorberg. Yeah. So that is a huge difference in, in the way you work. Um, what else is different? Uh, so status, let's call it status, which I think is also part of how you behave in work. You know, your status is a different one. Um, and then time to decision obviously is like, crazy different yeah especially but I think that's also true when you're not a CEO I mean I have to be a bit careful because I compare obviously an executive position where I still had a boss and a boss's boss yeah in Vodafone with a CEO position here uh, but I think I still would argue the time to decision is much faster in a startup and it's yeah. much more simple and you don't have I mean you don't produce oh another difference you don't have to produce that much PowerPoint in a in a in a startup you rarely you produce PowerPoint for customers or yeah. investors in a corporate, you produce PowerPoint for your colleagues and boss and boss's boss and God knows who, and, and you have to explain every decision. Yeah. Here we sit and we say, bam, 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 that's what we're doing. Okay, let's do it. The next day it's done. Or we start doing it. Yeah. Uh, plus then if you are uh, uh, managing people, you always have the works council, so you can't just change the role of somebody saying, hey, Florian, you have been doing this, but I think you're great at this. Do you agree? Yes. No, no, no. There's 10 other people who have to agree too, and perhaps the unions have to agree these kind of things. So that makes the whole life very different. But as I said, there's pros and cons. Yeah. And the, con uh, the pro is like the, like the, the big companies have an existing business, they make money and it works. Yes. So if Daimler build a car, you know there comes a good yes. car outside. If Tesla build it, 
there yeah. can be some bumps in the road. Exactly, and they have also existing customers. I'll give you an example. So I remember we were launching a, a, a Vodafone Live in 2001, the first web portal in Europe. And the discussion was, what's, how quick should it be? So we have the same here. How quick should the door open? When yeah. you tap the door, tensor back door, opener, yeah. how quick should it open? So here I made up a number and said, okay, it should in any case be under two seconds. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, 21, 22, that's okay. Yeah. What did I do with Vodafone? I did a research with real customers. Vodafone has 600 million customers. I did the research there, I analyzed it, I had a project, took a bit longer, but I got precise data. So we saw with a mobile portal, longer than five seconds, you suddenly the satisfaction goes way down. Yeah. So I knew this is the number. That's important for two reasons. One, uh, you have the actual number, you do it best based on data and not on CEO's gut feeling, yeah. or let's say it's experience, yeah. and I think it's right. But the other effect was, my IT colleague said, ah, no, it's never doable. We need at least 10 seconds. And I needed data to prove my point. Again, alignment of interests. Mm -hmm. uh, and I need to back up my point. So I had a full presentation showing that and how is it different between Japan and England and Brazil and God knows what. And we saw the numbers are pretty similar. But without that, he would have said, no, I disagree. It's a, uh, I think 10 seconds, are everything else is too expensive. Because yeah. then you also have to have a business case to invest money to bring down the time. Yeah. You know, these kind of things are very different in the way of working. But yeah. you have the resources to do it. Yeah. So now, is it better or worse? I, it's hard to judge. It's just different. Yeah, yeah. it's different. Yeah. Super interesting. Um, let's go shortly back to the structure because you brought the example with Google. Google has a really interesting company structure. They try to make it really startup-like, like really f like, um, f um, flat. And the interesting thing about Google is Google is so... They have so much diversity in it because they can have diversity in it that like it's easier for them to do. Like if you would build like sensor back to like a five thousand, fifty thousand company, uh, people company with like one goal of census, how you would how you would able to to make the streamlining there possible? Because I think the streamlining is then the biggest challenge that you can't. You can't have someone which starting to build cars right now that probably wouldn't fit so good into the portfolio. So you need to have more streamlining the whole company and still try to have the the, the flexible of a startup. So how you would approach that? Do you have an idea how you would set it up? Yeah. Um, well, I think streamlining, you talk about two different things. One is what is the product strategy or the product portfolio strategy? So what do we do for our customers? There, I agree that is something the company has to decide overall, but I think Google does that too, okay. right? So uh, uh, they make one exception, which is Google X, obviously, yeah. but that's for, for that purpose. Yeah. And even there, they don't start uh, uh, planting potatoes. It feels sometimes like that. Didn't yes, you? but you know, there's a boundary. <laughs> yeah. it's, a, okay. it's a wide boundary. Okay, okay. admit. Okay. <laughs> so that's one. Uh, second, streamlining within the organization, I... I don't believe in this uh, a central entity has to control all that. So I believe, and I think you can support that with a, a proper technical architecture in your product. If we talk technical product, uh, I believe about self-organizing teams. Yeah. And I mentioned it before, exponential organization, I think is a very interesting concept. Uh, look at how Spotify is organizing their engineering teams. That's the example I usually use. There's very good uh, videos. So in case anybody wants to watch them on YouTube, two videos, uh, 15 minutes each. Very good videos about this. Um, so what I, do I mean by that? Let's say, and, and uh, luckily modern IT architectures support that. So if you have a microservice architecture, um, you can do this. And that's what we already do at Sensorberg. And we use it both that we don't have this problem about constant negotiations, say, between front end and back end and database. But we also make it part of the product, yeah. which means I want that our customers and our partners can innovate on top of our platform. Yeah. And for that, I need that architecture anyway. So yeah. I, I catch two birds with one stone, basically. Yeah. Yeah, I can do both. And I think that helps a lot. Will it fix everything? I don't know. Yeah. I hope. Probably not. Um, so that would be the streamlining uh, on the product and technology side. Now, there's other streamlining uh, probably necessary. So how do you do this with sales and marketing? Yeah. My answer to that is I will closely, and that is debatable, but I will do it like this, and that's the nice thing about being the CEO. <laughs> um, we will integrate sales and marketing. Yeah. 
Um, why? Two reasons, two main reasons. One, I see, uh, and I hope that the marketeers now don't kill me, marketing more and more becomes a technical domain. Yeah. yeah I spoke to a colleague, startup CEO, who told me I have a 13 people marketing team now, one, three, 12 are engineers. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, wow. Okay. One, two. What is marketing uh, 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 in essence? I mean, there's different disciplines of marketing. So product marketing is a different story. That in a startup world counts to product. So it's not part of marketing. In a corporate world, it's product marketing is part of marketing. So I reported as product marketer to the chief marketing officer of Vodafone Group. Yeah. Okay. And then there's brand marketing. You usually don't have that in a startup. And then there's Marcoms, marketing communications. Yeah. So marketing communications, the, 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 the purpose in my world is to make people aware of your product in the end, yeah. right? Which means it's part of sales. Because then in startup speech and in modern speech is lead generation. Yeah. So suddenly you talk about lead generation and then you think, hmm, right, so what is sales? Well, sales is take the generated leads and convert them into customers. So suddenly you talk about lead generation and lead conversion. Yeah. And swoops, you have both yeah, together. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. That's the core sense of it. That's cool. Yeah. So that's how I streamline there. What else is there to streamline? Let me think. Well, HR, I work a lot with HR. Sensorberg has, as I said, uh, between 20 and 30 people, and we have a full time HR person, which is rather unusual. So yeah. I get that asked off by colleague CEOs why do you have an HR person? Simple answer I consider it very important, and you have to plant it early in the growth. Yeah. So it can grow, uh, you can grow with uh, uh, that HR mindset uh, already. So she does hiring, she does like the whole yes. um, legal stuff, which is... Well, the, we outsource the legal stuff, uh, she does recruiting, yes, uh, but also she t makes sure that everybody has uh, goals, uh, that I do my feedback talks often enough, everybody yeah. does their feedback talks, yeah. uh, that we have codified what we agree on in the a, in a, in a intranet, so we have an employee handbook, but it's a dynamic one. Yeah. Uh, why? Because I know when we start growing, the onboarding will be much easier yeah. when you have that in place. Uh, and it make, gives transparency. Not everybody can sit in every meeting, but if we say, hey, let's do this kind of stuff like this, uh, then everybody can read it there. And it makes it easier for me because my team knows I expect them. Uh, the new, it's not released the new version, so I have to be careful if anybody of my team listens to it. But when it will be released, I expect that this is known. Okay. So there's no excuse saying, I didn't know that. Yeah. If it's an employee handbook, people should read it. And we yeah. use Confluence, so you can subscribe to the pages. So if there's any change, yeah. you get a notification. You don't have to read it every day, yeah. right? So we work with technology there. So back to your streamlining question, I think those are the areas uh, where it's necessary. So I think we covered yeah. also all the of administrative, The administrative part, you outsource as well right now as much as Parking. possible. Right? So yeah. we, have a, we have someone who does uh, uh, bookkeeping and I have a guy um, um, who helps me with the finance part. Yeah. We don't have a CFO. Yeah. Uh, everything else, uh, well, I don't believe there should be too much administration. We yeah. try to keep this very flexible. Tooling wise, by the way, uh, if somebody has a new tool idea, they can try it. I don't mind. Uh, but then they have to uh, convince everybody that this is better than what we currently have. I stay out of that. Okay. I have no opinion, but just like anybody else. What, what are the general tools you use? Well, we sit on Google. Yeah. Um, uh, we use um, for uh, we use Slack. Um, what else do we use? Uh, we have Asana, although yeah. I feel this is dying. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for us, because yeah. I see nobody's using it really. Okay. Uh, not sure why yet. Um, so some you... experimenting with Trello. Yeah, Trello. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but as I said, in my in our company, we don't prescribe it. Uh, yeah. So uh, let's see what happens. I don't say we have to stop Asana now. Yeah. We have to start Trello. I see what happens, yeah. and then what most people use. Yeah. And then for CRM and sales and marketing, we use uh, HubSpot. Yeah. Yeah. And for Google, you use Google Drive and spreadsheets and we so use, on. Well, we still have Dropbox. Uh, I okay. still try get to, uh, to get rid of it, but uh, somehow Dropbox is uh, in certain aspects better than Google Drive. Okay. Uh, and I don't like it because it costs additional money, but I won't take it away yeah. from now because yeah. it helps the productivity. Yeah. Um, yes, and we try to not use PowerPoint, Excel and Word. We really try to use only uh, Google Suite, uh, including Hangouts, yeah. although we also use Zoom. Yeah. Zoom US because it's just better than Hangouts. Yeah. 
It's, um, it's another tip is a peer, a peer that is like also amazing, like yeah. way better than Skype or Hangout. Yeah, and uh, I don't know why, but that's yeah. why they are yeah. successful. Yeah. yeah, and I can only recommend it. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't get affiliate from Zoom. Yeah. Just in case. Uh, <laughs> did you did you had experience to change the structure? Because I could imagine if you'd want to try to move everything from Dropbox to Google Drive or so, it's people reject it because people don't want to have change there on this point. Yes. Uh, how do you attack this problem? Uh, not centrally, so I leave it to the teams how they organize okay. themselves. Um, and I have to admit, uh, well, the finance department is directly with me, uh, yeah. and I just said to one of my guys, okay, next year we have to clean up there, it's, yeah. a, it's a mess. Yeah. Uh, I don't have an answer for that, but if anybody does, uh, please write me an email because I'm looking for that answer too. Migration, forcing migration, I haven't done so far, and yeah. I have done it earlier in my career, so in, uh, in, uh, I also worked for three and a half years in Vattenfall running IT operations there and we moved from normal office to and start try to move yeah. to office 365 nightmare okay. yeah there again corporate much more complicated okay. you have to go through the works council they yeah. have to approve it then you yeah. have to do trainings yeah. and this and that you can't just start and see what happens that just doesn't work in the 30000 people understandable yeah. that's not yeah. that easy yeah i heard from a friend of a friend that they made a fixed date Like uh, like a fixed switch it off. Yeah, no, no. This is this is a moving party. So they, they didn't try to make it so seriously. They just took one day or one weekend off completely, and the only goal was to improve the structures and clean the sh clean it up. And you don't do anything else than that. And you try to make it more relaxed with like beer and so on and so on. And right. like try maybe that's the idea. I, I never I never experienced it myself. I just. How they approach the whole thing. I mean, my problem is I'm an engineer, so I, I you know, I like nice structures, but yeah. I'm aware that not everybody thinks like me. Yeah. So I'm not sure if prescribing a structure is good. Although sometimes I don't find anything. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really hard to find stuff. And yes, there's search, and I rely a lot of on search. I mean, yeah. it's the same as with email. I don't know. I remember before there was Gmail, I had lots of folders in my email. Yeah. I don't use folders anymore. Yeah. Just archive and I rely on full text search. Yeah. And I think document wise we will come to something similar. Yeah. Uh, well, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. So there was like an awesome uh, podcast that will also link down here where I talked a lot about like leading and then like how you lead your team. Um, so can you talk a bit more how do you lead yourself? Because it's the biggest challenge as CEO. Like nobody tells you what you need to do. So how, how is your approach to lead yourself? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, it's not entirely true because your investors tell you or try to yeah, tell you what yeah. to do. Um, so I just spoke to someone and said, I will get myself a coach again. I didn't okay. have a coach for a long time. I had uh, her for seven years and then that was between, I don't know, like until 2008 or nine. It was almost 10 years ago. Mm, and I learned a lot from there. Um, the first thing I learned is how do I recognize when I behave far back in my original bad behavior yeah. which everybody has yeah. you need to first diagnose before you can change anything yeah. so that's something I still can do and I see now that happens it always happens that's what I was explained when you are in stressful situations yeah. um, so that's one um, the other is you need to understand what takes energy from you and what gives you energy yeah so for me personally takes my energy when things go slow and I can't talk about stuff. Yeah. That's why I love podcasts. Yeah. Um, it gives me energy when there's a lot of stuff going on and there's stressful situations. Yeah. And I know for other people it's are different. Yeah. Um, so I, I, you need to play with that a bit. Yeah? Yeah. So you need to be conscious when you sit, for example, in a one-to-one a, in a -one with someone who is different that you consciously use energy, in my case, to be quiet and listen. Yeah. And listen perhaps 10 seconds longer than you normally would do. Yeah. Stuff like that. And that's something you can train. Um, other than that, I read a lot of books. Yeah. yeah. I mentioned the exponential organization, so I try to stay up to date with new concepts. I, I read the Google HR pages. Um, I don't read so many books about self-optimization. I don't know, perhaps I'm too old, I don't know, but it's more like trying to understand systems which make yeah. a company better or a product better and try to derive what can I do for that and what can other skill types do for that. Yeah. Um, and uh, I talk to fellow CEOs. Yeah. 
Yeah, and by the way, it doesn't matter which age they are. I mean, I'm 48, but there are CEOs who are like 32, and I still can learn from them because yeah. we all share the same problem. Yeah. Um, so learning from somebody is, is, you should always be open. And, uh, you know, I have a son who is 18, because he turns 19, now I can learn from him things. I yeah. think he can learn from me things. So leading yourself means being open. And we have it here, back here in the wall. There's one of, we have 10 things we think everybody can do without uh, having studied or having any specific yeah. talent. One is being coachable. Yeah. So you need to be open for input from others. And don't say it's just someone who works for me. Yeah. Why is that worse input? Yeah. Right? Or your yeah. son or whatever. Yeah, it's yeah. not worse input. Yeah. It can be a very valid input. Yeah. Pretty good point, pretty good point. Um, what is your biggest challenge today? Today on Wednesday or today nowadays? Um, you can say both. Okay. Like what's going on today? Today, today well, I still have uh, many appointments which and I see a customer in in factory in a, in a few minutes, so that will be a challenge to convince this guy or this per, or this team or this group uh, that uh, obviously is great. I mean, they will see the great experience, but turning that into a deal is still yeah. a big step. Yeah. That's the nice thing about running an IoT company, especially when you do buildings, you can show stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and they can experience the experience, which yeah. is very convincing. Uh, but still turning it into a deal in a reasonable time frame. That's my biggest challenge for today, I guess. And my biggest challenge nowadays is um, scaling the sales, first of all, uh, and balancing out, uh, because now we have really good product market fit. So we, right now we don't do any outbound marketing. We have yeah. lots of inbounds. Um, But I, one of my, my sales director recently said, oh, I'm not sure if we should do more sales uh, uh, because how do we deliver all that? Yeah. And I said, well, you do more sales, don't worry about it, I yeah. fix the rest. Yeah. Now, what will happen is it's always like, a, it's always like a, how do you call that, a, a race. So first you have not enough sales yeah. and then you have more sales and then you yeah. have to deliver and yeah. you keep the quality. So doing that in a, like in a ladder, in a proper way, at a high speed, that will be the biggest challenge. Yeah. But congratulations, that's what every startup wants. They want to have a demand and then they need to figure out how to deliver that. But like the first problem is how do I get the demand for my product? So kind of luxury problem. So. Yes, the problem is when you do when you open doors in buildings and it doesn't work, people get yeah. very angry yeah. very quickly. Yeah. So quality Good is point, of essence. Yeah. So it's not like you know, I did SaaS startups before and other things. Well, you always should have a good quality. Yeah. Yeah. But if then, uh, you know, there's an outage for five minutes, uh, the world doesn't stop. But yeah. if you can't enter the whole building for five minutes and you have a co-working space, that is a bit of a problem. Or if all those are open the whole all time. All those are open. <laughs> exactly. So it's, you know, here we have what well, we always have a, a, a time quality cost, a magical triangle. Yeah. So um, uh, here it's like quality is uh, of very high importance, yeah. especially If it doesn't work, people will start talking about it. It's yeah. not a nice experience if you always have to wait to open a door. Yeah. If it never works, yeah. So yeah. then we are screwed. So yeah. you know that's an additional parameter. I think we have to take into consideration. Pretty good point, and also really good point because it worked. Like you got a really nice market fit, so the demand came out of that. Really good yes. point. Last question: um, What if you could go back in time? What for advice you would give your 20 year old self and your 30 year old self? Which advice you would give? Okay, that's always, yeah, um, <clears throat> sometimes I say, ah, I wish I would have done the startup stuff earlier, Yeah. Uh, but then I see, you know, what I did made me like, my, made my experience like it is right now, and perhaps the, the, I can profit from it now more than I think, so it's always hard to say, do I change something? Uh, but one advice I can give is certainly, um, if you feel you want to do something different, Don't be worried about what that means in terms of risk and, and can I live of it or not and this and that. Uh, that was, well, 30 years ago a bit different because the work situation for uh, uh, people was a bit worse. But now I think, and that's the advice I give my son, and he's, as I said, just turns 19, um, do whatever you think is you like to do because if you're good at it, you will find some way to make money with it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's enough work and there's enough interesting work and the world is changing so fast so that is something I should have done more. Um, the other thing is get a coach earlier. I should have gotten a coach uh, earlier and the coach doesn't have to be a $10,000 a month person. It can be a friend yeah. uh, or fellow business partner. 
get someone who you trust, who gives you feedback and who you can bounce off ideas and yeah. thoughts. Yeah. So I should have done that much earlier. Um, and be open about your thoughts. That doesn't mean that you tell everybody when you think uh, he or she is an idiot that he or she is an idiot, but you can be open and not hurt anybody that is possible. But uh, be authentic and, and I mean, I always was pretty open, but you know, you're less authentic as a 20 year old because you always think, can I say this? Yeah. Or I th it might be different in this generation, but in my generation, you were like, oh, there's my boss boss and uh, I don't dare to say everything. I know as a boss boss so now that I really appreciate that if it, it well, if it makes sense yeah. and if it's done in a nice way, not in a pushy way, but just saying, hey, may I say I have a different opinion here, the reasons, what do you think? And then you have a dialogue. Yeah. That's no problem. Awesome. Michael, thank you very much. Pleasure. Do you want to say something at the end? No, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thank and you. Uh, yeah, thanks. Cool. Thank you, sir.